Hello, my wonderful viewers, and welcome to another episode of Betty Adams Overanalyzes. Today, we're going to look at Season 3, Episode 4 of Lost in Space. Nothing left behind. As usual, there will be a spoiler-free section and then a fully spoiler section. I will let you know when the spoilers are coming. I've got to say that whatever issues I had with Episode 3, I had none of them with Episode 4. Everyone really seems to be in, in character. The characters are well and stably written. And again, if they were written out of character in the last episode, it is probably because this is where they the show had to make edits to fully account for the major changes they had to make after cutting out the last two episodes because of budget constraints. But if they were in character, I still haven't decided that. I don't know. I, I still think episode three was one of the episodes that took a hit from the rewriting, but that was ne necess necessitated by eliminating the... To final two episodes. But in this one, this is a very, this episode manages to balance emotional and thematic depth and action quite nicely. You have these two completely different storylines still interacting with each other, and the themes really run through. You have themes of sacrifice, what individual characters are willing to do for either another character or for the greater good. You have themes of defiance in the face of insurmountable odds, doing everything in your power to defy uh, the powers that are not necessarily even trying to oppress or kill you, just defiance against the inevitable conclusions. And then you have a theme of ignorance, actually. It, I, it just hits you really, really hard as the viewer that even with Will's connection with Robot, even with those really close connections, there's still so much that the humans don't understand about the robots. And you especially, you get a sense that the, the robots are doing their own thing, that there are personal grudges between the robots, that the robots are acting on impulses that have nothing to do with the humans or their short time in the system. And the humans assume that the robots are after them, have grudges against them, are focused on them, but it really, really gives, this episode really, really gives you the feeling that there are greater patterns at work here, that the robots are responding to old, old grudges. There is, of course, the stated theme of hope, because it's stated so clearly in the episode what's going on there. I'm not going to mess with that. Then you have another theme that's more subtle. It's not mentioned. A theme of meaning. Why do we do things? And you have different people coming at this from different angles. And this, the, you've got the situation, the, the peak situation of the episode is bearing down. And sometimes they have hope, sometimes they don't. But you can see the characters striving after meaning each in their own way and I again I think that if I had to pick an episode that was the strongest thematically that really really touched the human condition it might be this one this might be the soundest episode thematically of the series if definitely of the season and I really enjoyed it, despite the pain, despite the suffering. Now, that's it for my spoiler-free review. I really want to talk about some spoilery elements in, in episode four, because there is just a lot to talk about here. So, Scarecrow. This is the one where he absolutely doesn't die. Oh my goodness, we can, I was looking at this, and even I made the mistake of thinking he was dead first, but we've seen what it takes to kill the robots. We know kind of how their body works. Their thought processes, their ability to think to reason, do, does seem to be centered in their heads right where their communication hubs is. That does appear to be, you know, they have forward-facing vision, and th that appears to be where they pick up sound as well. And so you have a pretty standard physiological setup. The center, central processors, the brains, are centered in their skulls. Their skulls are heavily armored, heavily protected, and they've got, you know, 
again, forward-facing vision because they're a very predatory species, it looks like. It looks like they were crafted by dog he by aliens with kind of dog-like heads. And so that makes sense. But the robot's memory, their self, their core, as it were, is stored deep down inside their heavily armored abdomen where it's much, much harder to get damaged. This makes sense. The robot's personality appears to be stored in a black box in the center and the robot can be revived from this core, this center. So looking back, it was rather foolish of me to even say that Scarecrow was dead. Now we get that information by one of the characters stating it, but the character who states it is Will. And Will has had just displayed his inability to communicate with robot and his misunderstanding of robot just before that now robot seems really really upset because he leaves the room and doesn't seem to be able to talk to will after scarecrow off lines after sar elim eliminates scarecrow but let's look back at that scene where sar does eliminate scarecrow sar has driven a spike into the back of his head crushed his faceplate, but we know that's not fatal. Sar took an entire lightning blast from Robot straight to the face, and that didn't damage him. What Sar did here is literally snap Scarecrow's neck. Now, for a human, that is 100% fatal. But for one of these robots, that probably is a si simply disabling feature. So, the the, they, you take the center of thought and you completely disconnect it from the body. The core can no longer control the body. That would have ended S Scarecrow's connection to Robot. And maybe Robot thought Scarecrow was dead. Maybe he didn't. Maybe Robot knew it was just an immobilization technique and figured he could go back and rescue Scarecrow. Or maybe rescuing Scarecrow wasn't in the cards until all the children were safe. But the fact that we actually don't see Scarecrow die on screen, we, we, we deliberately see him immobilized, take a Mickey Finn to the back of the neck, as it were, tells me that Scarecrow was supposed to be revived in the final episode in the original season, in the original version of the season. But again, they weren't able to because of restrictions. Now... But another theme from you get from that scene is defiance. Scarecrow is clearly fighting whatever Sar is trying to do. Clearly this is to protect Robot and the children. We, the show establishes that Scarecrow, no matter what he feels about humans in general, he does have a soft spot for the children. He wants to protect them. And he is perfectly willing to defy Sar to do that on whatever level, and he's obviously not cooperating with Sar. Now, when Robot was in a similar situation, Sar was actually fairly patient with him and allowed Robot a chance to cooperate. Robot tried to cooperate, but Sar doesn't, doesn't give that chance to Scarecrow, suggesting it's is really strongly hinting the way they interact with each other that they have a pre-existing relationship. And interestingly enough, the twisting of the neck, the breaking of the head, the warping of the face. If you look at how, in this scene and the scene from the previous episode, what Sar is doing to Scarecrow's head, it, it really, really puts those first injuries we see in a completely different perspective. I think we had all been assuming that Scarecrow got those injuries when he crashed, but I noted before, we've seen crash what happens to with blunt force trauma to the robots. They get ripped in half, limbs get ripped off, but Scarecrow's limbs were shredded, not ripped off, and he was still trying to pilot the ship, and his head was twisted and warped. And it's we don't know how he crashed exactly, but it did look like a high-speed impact. Scarecrow wasn't crushed, he was warped. And it really does look like those were the same kind of injuries he had after Sar had been working him over. So, here's a question. Was Scarecrow injured by the crash? Why did he crash in the first place? I'm thinking the show is pointing towards Scarecrow was escaping Sar. That would put a very tight timetable on what happened that led Scarecrow to Earth, but I can't get into that without giving spoilers for episodes further down the path. But anyway, so you have this theme of defiance. Dawn and Maureen and the rest of the adults doing their best to defy R and what they think is going to be their death. The children defying their parents' orders to come back and rescue them. And you have Scarecrow defying Sar. 
Then you have, of course, the theme of hope. Again, the show goes over that. There's not really much that much to discuss there. All in all, I think this was a very well-written, well-acted episode. I noticed they spend a lot of time on the adults, and the, the, the actors that they chose for the adults, they're top-notch actors, they just knocked it out of the park. This episode really gets you in the feels. You can feel them waiting to die, you can feel their excitement, and another thing that I really enjoyed is these aren't perfect people. They make emotional decisions. They have purely emotional and logical reactions that are very human. These writers, they really know how to write convincing reactions. The, the adults, logically, should have been furious when the kids showed back up in the system, but they were just happy to see their kids. And then, of course, you have the escape, and, of course, the problem at the end of the episode. Why didn't the Jupiter take more damage? Why wasn't the damage more devastating when they crashed, uh, when, when the damage happened? But, you know, that's, that's sci-fi for you. The ships are as strong as they need to be to, for the episode. The antagonists are as fast as they need to be. And physics must always bow to storytelling. All right, so what do you think, my friends? Was that, do you agree with me that this was one of the emotionally and thematically philosophically soundest episodes? And do you think that the damage that we see Sar give Scarecrow could explain the majority of Scarecrow's damage in the original, in his original crash landing on Earth in, that we saw in season two? And does that mean that the only reason that Scarecrow did crash land on Earth was that Sar had been working him over? What is between them? What... What's, what was going on between all these robots before the human waltz, humans waltzed into the picture? Leave your theories below. I'd really love to hear them. I've just been mulling over this show ever since I watched the third season. And hit that like and subscribe button. Go check out my books, Humans Are Weird. I have the data and Humans Are Weird. We took a vote. Available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. And peace out, my wonderful viewers. Humans Are Weird. We took a vote and Humans Are Weird. I have the data. Two books in a series of human absurdity. Go check out these short story collections. What will our little green friends think of us when we finally do make it to space? Find out the answer in two books of human absurdity. Humans are weird, we took a vote, and humans are weird, I have the data. Available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo and Google Play.